Thank you very much for the opportunity to present here today at Western Galilee um, College. I will talk about a part of my PhD project that focuses on photographic practices in Nazi concentration camps, specifically photographs uh, taken by SS men. I will present my approaches and preliminary conclusions concerning uh, the significance of survivor testimonies uh, survivor testimonies um, in my study about perpetrator sources with a focus on my recent findings from the Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles where I had the privilege to work as a fellow at the Center for Advanced Genocide Studies with the databases of the Visual History Archive this February. In the given time for this presentation I will not introduce you to all aspects of my research project. I want to focus today on the potential of survivor testimonies as complementary sources for the analysis of historical photographs, as precisely pictures taken by perpetrators. I will give you an overview of the main sources of my projects, namely SS photos from concentration camps, and discuss some of my assumptions and approaches towards researching these perpetrator documents. Throughout the presentation, I will underline the in indispensable integration of the perspective of victims and also liberators and bystanders to understand the perspective of the perpetrators that is, as I claim, manifested in the SS photos. The visual history of the Holocaust is formative in the public memory of the camps. There are many pictures that are commonly associated with the Holocaust. Here are a few examples that you will be familiar with. All these images have in common that they were not taken in active Nazi concentration camps but rather after the liberation by Allied photographers or even years after the war and the Holocaust by tourists. They are taken on the authentic place of a camp, but not during its existence. Nevertheless, these pictures became symbols of the Holocaust or the Nazi terror in general. Historian Cornelia Brink described them as so-called secular icons and they are often immediately recognized. So these pictures uh, um, were referred to by Cornelia Brink as uh, secular icons. Um, the history of the establishment as symbols for the Holocaust, of course not only these pictures, but pictures like that, um, started uh, actually uh, right after uh, the end of the, of, the, of the war and the liberation of the camps. Charles Weil, who served in the American 42nd Infantry Division, participated in the liberation of the Dachau concentration camp. In his Shoah Foundation testimony, Weil recalls that many pictures were taken by American soldiers at the liberated camp. However, when the GIs wanted to develop the pictures in Munich, all photos that documented atrocities, atrocities disappeared at the photo store. Therefore, Weil used pictures from his division's commemorative book, among them this example, to illustrate his own memory, therefore merging his subjective experience with the story of his unit and using someone else's photographs as evidence for his own memory, a phenomenon that is very widespread in oral history interviews, including the collections of the Shoah Foundation. But this is a topic for itself. I will not deal with post-war photos and questions of memory and photography in depth in my thesis, although the story of relatively well-known liberator photos is not disconnected from the time of the active concentration camps, I focus on documents created by perpetrators rather than liberators or victims. Therefore, in my research, I deal with very different photographs to these post-liberation images, namely pictures that were taken by SS men in Nazi concentration camps. My time frame is 1933 to 1945, However, my focus is mainly on the years 1936 uh, onwards. To narrow my topic down, I will focus in time entirely on, as I call it, institutionalized perpetrator photography in the camps, meaning photographs that were taken by SS photographers who worked there. This excludes photos that were taken privately by, the, by individuals and the rare cases of prisoner photography. I will focus on the Erkennungsdienste in English identification departments. Officially, only SS men who worked in these departments were allowed to photograph in Nazi concentration camps after 1936. Prisoners, many of whom were professional photographers, 
were forced to assist. The basic task of the identification departments in the camps resembled the work of an identification department of the police, meaning they were responsible for creating pictures and individual files of prisoners after their arrival at the camp and keeping records of the living and dead camp inmates. Mugshot pictures were taken inside the barracks or rooms of the identification departments, such as these examples from the Auschwitz concentration camp. These standardized portraits were supposed to be taken of all registered prisoners. Deportees who were killed by the SS right after their arrival in the camps were not photographed. One of the photographers who took these pictures at the Auschwitz concentration camp was Wilhelm Brasse. Brasse was registered as a Polish political prisoner at Auschwitz and was forced to work at the identification department because he was a trained photographer before the German invasion. That's too much. In his testimonies, mm -hmm. Mr. Brasse vividly described the horrendous and brutal scenery of taking these pictures. He would emphasize the dehumanizing situation and the fear of those being photographed that stands in dark contrast to the, at least according to police standards of mugshots, orderly and professional appearance of these photographs. After liberation, he refused to continue working as a photographer due to his terrible memories of working in the Auschwitz identification department. Despite the dehumanizing and violent context of mugshots in concentration camps, these pictures are nowadays used to individualize uh, the deportees. Mugshots, many of them taken by Mr. Brasse, are, for instance, promi prominently featured at the Auschwitz Memorial in an exhibition that is being shown not far from the original site of the identification department in that camp. The switch in meaning and the appropriation of SS photos started right after the liberation. Furthermore, survivor, some survivors sometimes reenacted these pictures and used them as memorabilia for their time in the camps. After liberation, some survivors took pictures that clearly resemble identification department mugshots. However, in comparison to actual SS photos, the former prisoners look much more self-confident and in some cases even proud, such as in this example, a photo of camp survivor Oskar Singer taken uh, in liberated Theresienstadt by a Soviet female officer on May 10, 1945. The meaning and the function of the photos, in this case identification photography, change and very much depend on the context of usage. Without going into, into too many details now, I want to point out uh, the fact that the camp administration created identification departments. This fact that they created them inside their camps tells us something about continuations of police institutions in concentration camps and the self-conception of the SS. Identification departments as police officers were first created in the 19th century as part of so-called scientific police work, meaning supposedly objective police work that was based on categorizing the population in clearly defined groups and models of social engineering. I argue that the photos produced in these departments must be understood in this tradition of creating evidence for, lega for the legality and objectivity of its associated institutions in this case, the concentration camps. But to get back to the history of SS photography. Basically, the identification department served, besides the role of identification and categorization of deportees, also as the official photo studios in their respective camps, and the SS photographers who worked there were responsible for photographing in the camp uh, in general. These pictures that were taken at the Mauthausen concentration camp by SS photographers are part of, se of a series of images that document the arrival of the first Soviet prisoners of wars, uh, war in Mauthausen. At this point, I want to give you an overview of photographs that were taken by SS photographers uh, that serve as the base of my study. Therefore, I will, I will refer to groups of motives that I chose and that are based on common categorizations in earlier studies about the topic. I will briefly show you a selection of images from various camps without going into too many details, so please interrupt me if you have questions about specific photos. Besides the racist aesthetic of these pictures, especially the one on the right, um, they are highly problematic for another reason. 
Francisco Boix, a professional photographer and resistance fighter against fascism in Spain, who was forced to work as a prisoner in the Mauthausen Identification Department, commented on these photo series of Soviet POWs during the Nuremberg trials by stating, I quote, this was done only for the, photograph for the photographs, the reality was quite different. Boix further points out that some of the Soviet um, POWs were photographed multiple times while conducting relatively easy work at the Mauthausen quarry. Shortly afterwards, they were murdered. Although these specific images are not preserved and their further usage is not documented, Boyk's testimony highlights the importance to look for counter narratives to the SS photos and their stories, the stories that are manifested in these pictures. Another common motive of SS photos is the concentration camp itself. Images of the camp often document working places of prisoners, meaning places of forced labor, such as these examples from the women's concentration camp at Ravensbrück. I argue that these pictures very clearly show the staged character, not only of the depicted scenes, but the whole photo album in general. The female prisoners um, seem to wait for the photo to be taken. The focus of the pictures the lightning and the depth are carefully prepared. The depicted women do not move and are rather part of these facilities. The emphasis on the, is on the workforce uh, rather than their suffering and fear as prisoners of a Nazi concentration camp. This seems obvious for someone who is uh, familiar with the realities, realities of Ramsbrück. However, the pictures clearly do not illustrate that reality. Especially when being compared to descriptions of survivors of the same facilities of the camp. For instance, the huge and well-equipped camp kitchen documented on SS photos suggests a professional and sufficient providing of food. However, survivor testimonies, such as the one of Helen Klein, conducted by the Shoah Foundation, document the enormous lack of food at Ramsburg. This example clearly highlights the importance of integrating survivor testimonies in analysis of photo, photos or photo albums created by perpetrators to understand the other side of the picture that was, which was not photographed. Many pictures such as these were preserved in photo albums for different purposes. Especially in these cases, the line between official photography and private photography can be blurry. This photo, developed at the Mauthausen concentration camp, shows SS officers at the camp in their middle, Franz Zierer as the commandant. This picture and many similar ones are documents of the self-image of the perpetrators, the way they wanted to be remembered as uh, manly soldiers doing their duty among comrades. After liberation, some photographs deliberately break the image of the strong and self-confident SS man. American soldier Charles Sandler tells the story of these pictures in his Shoah Foundation interview. The first photo on the left was taken after the capture of Commandant Zierz when he was brought back to Gusen concentration camp, a subcamp of Mauthausen. He tried to escape but was shot and injured. In Gusen, former prisoners and US Army personnel interviewed Zierz. What happened afterwards is not clearly documented. Probably he was handed over to survivors of the camp. The exact story of the picture of Zierz's corpse cannot be reconstructed. However, the interview with Charles Sandler proves that the photo was developed more than once and might have been out, handed out at, as a memorabilia during the first phase after liberation when the former concentration camp was used as a DP camp, presumably as a satisfactory and maybe also reassuring document of proof of the death of a main perpetrator. However, this picture was not only used by liberators and survivors. The photo circulates on anti-Semitic websites as alleged evidence for, as they would claim, fake testimony of Zias in connection with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about Simon Wiesenthal, who was liberated by US troops at Mauthausen. An anti-Semitic montage of Wiesenthal is attached to the picture of the dead commandant, suggesting Wiesenthal's or the Jews' responsibility for the killing of Zias and therefore covering up the reality at Mauthausen. This is one of many examples of the misusage of photography from concentration camps by Holocaust deniers or anti-Semites. And it 
is of high significance to reflect on the dangers of photos and the potential of mis misusage and deliberate misinterpretation uh, nowadays. The photos of the commandant raise significant questions that need to be reflected when working with perpetrator pictures. To what extent should we as historians or as educators use the self-image of perpetrators as illustrations and to what extent do these images reproduce an image that the perpetrators wanted to create about themselves and therefore how do they distort the historical reality. Furthermore, should we use counter images to the self-image of the perpetrators and should we use dehumanizing pictures of them such as the photo of Tia's corpse. In short, how do we visualize perpetrators today and what stories we therefore tell about them? It is important to point out that violence, a core element of the concentration camp system, is seldom documented in preserved photos from the camps. My emphasis here is, however, on the word preserved, as survivor testimonies indicate that there was indeed a wider amount of pictures taken by SS men. For instance, Wilhelm Brasse, the Polish political prisoner and photographer at Auschwitz, remembered that he had to develop pictures of Soviet prisoners of war who were murdered with axes at the camp. The strict regulations concerning photographed violence connected with the destruction of many visual sources by perpetrators in the last stage of the war are probably the main reasons why these photographs are not preserved today. But maybe they are still in cellars and attics and might one day be rediscovered. Due to this disappearance of photos of obvious violence, the pictures we have today from concentration camps document them as clean working facilities, often without any visible prisoners, and certainly no violence besides, from the perspective of the SS, legitimate shootings of escapees and official executions. The violence behind these pictures become visibly only by integrating the perspective of survivors who themselves often were very aware of the lack of proper documentation of crimes. Therefore, some former camp inmates even reenacted the violence they experienced as documented in the following pictures. In the following picture, not this one. That was preserved by Buchenwald survivor Judith Becker and shown during her interview by the Shoah Foundation. Judith Becker emphasizes in her interview that there was always someone hanging at the gallows at Buchenwald. However, assumably due to the lack of evidence, these hangings were restaged shortly after liberation and copies of the pictures were handed out to document the crimes committed by the SS. Immediately after the downfall of the Third Reich, survivors of the camp started to counter the narratives of the perpetrators manifested in pictures that visually erased the violence <coughs> in the camps. I argue that we should take the attempts of the survivors to fight these distorting images seriously and integrate their, their stories in analysis of perpetrator stories, sources more profoundly. My project is a plea for reflecting on the significance and potential of photos in historical research. These S photos show the dangers of uncritical usage of these perpetrator documents, not only by anti-Semites who want to distort the truth, but also by creating a false image of the camp's reality by merely using them as authentic visualizations of victims' experiences. However, they are also unique sources themselves when critically examined. They have, for instance, the potential to answer questions concerning the connection of pra practical and ideological aspirations of the perpetrators by examining the links of photographic and mental images. Therefore, I hope that my project will contribute to perpetrator studies specifically by introducing victims uh, perspectives and new analytical ways of looking at SS pictures. I want to go beyond the frame of the perpetrator's cameras to rethink how the concentration camps are visualized and imagined and therefore explore hitherto overlooked sources for and aspects of the camp's history. Thank you.